I'm visiting here with Mitch Davis. He's a writer, producer, screenwriter of the major feature films. And Mitch, welcome to today's show. Hey, thanks, Alan. Great to be here with you. Really excited to hear everything you want to know from me. I'm good with free advice. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm really excited. I've seen some of your movies. I've seen the uh, other side of heaven that you did with Disney. And, uh, but you've done a number of works out there. And I wanna, I'll, I'll circle back to that in just a little bit, but in a quick uh, synopsis, uh, how did you, how did you roll into this industry? Wow, this industry, uh, how did I roll into this industry? Um, the truth is I wanted to be a writer. Uh, my whole dream was to be a sports writer Growing up in high school, I was the guy sitting on the bench, not on the field, on the court. And I, I wanted to be a sports writer. I thought it would be great to make a living going to sporting events and getting paid to write about them. But that grew into wanting to write longer form things. And then that grew into, well, maybe I should write movies because that's the medium of the masses. And I had kind of a personal spiritual experience that pushed me in that direction. I had to, I had to, I had to find a way to make movies. And um, so it went from being sports writer to screenwriter to, no, I got to be a director because I don't want to give people my scripts and have them botch them. I got to direct what I write. And then I figured out that that didn't matter if I wasn't the producer because the producer controls the director. So I kind of went from a sports writer to film producer <laughs> Because, because I just out of a kind of a natural progression, um, I figured out that uh, the only way I could really be assured that I could write what I wanted to write, direct it the way I wanted it to be directed, and have it released in the form I intended was if I was a producer and hired myself to do all those things. Well, uh, to, it's it's been a it's been quite a journey for you. Um, so when you got in film early on, you were working as a writer, and then during this transition that you went into directing, um, you know, it, was it did you immediately get into uh, a producing of the movie The Other Side of Heaven, or w was that one of your first films, or were there other short films before that? You know, I. I sort of had a spiritual experience in 1979 that made it clear to me that someday I was supposed to make a movie about the missionary experience. And that was in 1979. I had no more a clue what it meant to make a movie in 1979 than I knew how to, uh, you know, climb on Everest barefoot. I didn't know a thing about movies, mm -hmm. but I knew in 1979 that that was what I was supposed to do. So that began a journey of going back to university, studying creative writing, getting married, having a child, getting a job, paying off student loans, and then going back to USC to get a master's degree in film production so I could learn a little bit about how to make movies. And that led to a job at Disney. And after a couple of years, a job at Columbia Studios, all the while I was writing screenplays, trying to get something going. And uh, it took from the moment I had that experience in 1979 to the moment the other side of heaven got made, it was 21 years. Wow. The 21 year journey to qualify myself to make what I hoped would be one good movie. How did you come across John Groberg's story? You know, when I had that experience uh, about when I had that spiritual experience telling me that I had to make a movie about what it meant to be a missionary, I kind of assumed I was a missionary at the time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of assumed that the movie I would write and produce would be about my missionary experience. And I actually wrote that up and, but it wasn't that impressive. <laughs> it wasn't that great. And some friends of mine knew that I wanted to make a missionary movie and they kept telling me, you should read this book by John Groberg. It's an amazing book. And I, I ignored their entreaties for years. And then finally one of them grabbed his own copy of the book off his shelf 
and kind of shoved it at me and said, just shut up and read this book. Uh, and that's how it happened. Um, I read that book and literally I was on page 10 and I, I felt like, I mean, I just was overwhelmed with a sensation that this is, this is the story. This is the, this is the movie. So that's how it happened. Um, kind of a, a good, a good persistent friend who wouldn't just, take my answer. Just curious, where did you serve your mission? I was a missionary in Argentina for two years. And uh, I was there during a turbulent time. There was a lot of uh, government turmoil going on. The government of Chile was in disarray and the government of Argentina was under a military junta. There were desaparecidos, people disappearing off the streets in the middle of the night. Uh, it was a weird time, uh, but an amazing experience. I'll never forget those people, that place, the sounds, the smells, the culture. Um, and I took a lot of those feelings about my experience in a foreign country and, and infused them with John Groberg's amazing experiences in Polynesia. So you went through the other side of heaven yeah. and uh, I understood that I heard rumors that you never wanted to do the sequel that was actually done a number of years later. Well, what's your, what's the story behind that? I mean, the, the first movie, which I saw was wonderful, but the sequel. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching both, I guess. Um, it's true. I did the first film in the year 2000 and we had a pretty good budget. Um, and we had good luck with actors. We had an Academy Award winning actress in our film. Uh, she went on to win an Academy Award. She didn't have it at the time. Anne Hathaway. Uh, things turned out pretty well. And so I was not anxious to make a sequel. Uh, I wasn't because I didn't think we could do as good a job. We would, we'd had a lot of good things a good, lot of good luck and you can have bad luck too. And then the other thing was that uh, financially, the first film was not a success. Um, we spent enough money to make it because we wanted to make it a high quality that it was not profitable for the investors. And I knew that if we made a sequel, we would have to make one of two choices. We would either have to make it much, much smaller on a much more limited budget in order for it to be more profitable, or we would uh, have to risk losing more investment dollars. And I didn't want to do either thing. I didn't want to make a poor man's version of the first film. I didn't want people to look at it and say, gee, the first one was great, but the second one, ooh. Um, and secondly, I didn't, so, so I resisted for, for like 17 years. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people want, I mean, a lot of people came to me uh, anxious for the sequel to be made. And I, 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 I said no for 17 years. I even gave the rights to other filmmakers to try to pursue it and do the sequel. And they, they ultimately didn't succeed and the rights came back to me. And, and then Elder Groberg came to me and we had a nice visit, nice lunch together. And then he, Elder Grover got kind of sober, kind of serious. And he said, you know, Mitch, I'm not getting any younger and neither are you. Um, it's time, it's time to do this. What's it gonna take? And he said some very key words. He said, What's it, what will it take to do the job right? And for me, that, those were, that was music to my ears because he wasn't saying, how little can we spend so we can make a bunch of money? He said, what will it take to do the job right? It was more important to him to tell a story well than to, you know, turn a huge profit. And I told him and he didn't balk at all. He said, let's do it. And, uh, and I kind of resisted. I said, well, wait a second. We don't have any of that money. He said, oh, we will. And I said, how? He said, I don't know, but we will. Uh, and 
And then he finally, he got that I was resisting and he got kind of forceful. He said, he said, and this is, I think, a great principle. He said, you are to proceed from this moment forward as if you had all that money in the bank. I said, but I don't. <laughs> he said, you will. I said, how? He said, I don't know, but you will. Proceed. So that's what happened. And this, the, the first film, the first film, if there was an Energizer bunny that just kept going and going and going to make the first film a reality, that would probably was me. Uh, the second film, The Energizer Bunny, was definitely uh, John Groberg. Uh, he just, he would not be denied because he had a, he felt a responsibility to a, one of his co colleagues, a fellow by the name of Thomas S. Monson, uh, who had given him the charge to write not just the first book, but the first book and the second book. And he felt an obligation to Thomas S. Monson to see both books turned into film. And that's why he would not take no for an answer. Uh, and I finally got the message. In the sequel, you know, he did a fabulous job with The Other Side of Heaven. But what was it in the second book that was not in the first book that made it so much more powerful? That made the second one more powerful? Or because what I, as, okay, let me rephrase that question. So what I've heard is as you did the first one, you have plenty of money, yeah, plenty of drive. But the second one was a little different by the way that Elder Groberg was driving this, hmm. a message, a message that needed to be heard that was not, that was not accurately emphasized in the first movie yeah what was it that what was it that caused that second one to come out thank you uh the first film the first our our objective for the first film was to make an adventure movie with spiritual elements in it that disney would like to distribute that was our entire goal uh, we weren't going to shy away from the fact that this was about a missionary. Uh, we even said the M word a couple times, uh, Mormon, but we didn't emphasize the religious aspects of the story. It was more of a coming of age story. And by all accounts, we succeeded in telling that story. Disney did end up distributing the film. Um, and, and that was a huge, huge coup and a great blessing. Um, in the second film, uh, we kind of took our gloves off and just said, hey, this is what this movie's about. This is who these people are. This is where their hearts are. This is, when you cut them, they bleed. When you hurt them, they weep when sometimes they laugh and they make you laugh. But we just did not, in the second film, we did not shy away from the fact at all that this movie was about Mormon missionaries. What both films have in common is that there is significant uh, conflict that gives way to love and uh, humanity between people of different religious faiths. In the first film, uh, a Mormon missionary is dying of starvation and a Methodist minister uh, gives him uh, a gift of a jar of jam that will save his life. It's really very much patterned after the woman at the well feeding Elijah her last meal. Um, eat my jam and live, uh, he says to John Groberg. And this was a man who originally, when he saw this Caucasian Mormon missionary on his island, was not at all happy to see him. That's in the first film. But in the second film, it's, it's more direct conflict. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's 
and in, in my opinion, it's a more powerful story. There's more drama, more raw honesty and raw emotion in the second film. It's a little bit less of a cakewalk. First film was PG rated. Second film was PG-13. I'll tell you the other thing that's really different, however, about the two films. Um, the making of the two films was entirely different. With the first film, we had enough money to shoot a 55 day schedule for a 110 page script. That's two pages a day. That's a good ratio. That's a good achievable ratio. Um, and it was a fairly contained story. Uh, there weren't any hugely difficult elements to contend with in that first film. It was complicated, it was hard, but it was all achievable. The second film uh, was a much bigger story, a much more complicated story with many more difficult elements. Uh, they say never to make a movie on water or with children or animals. Well, a large part of this movie takes place in a boat, in a storm, on the water, with children and animals. <laughs> and it was just, it was a very difficult movie to make. We, we made the second movie in 31 days instead of 55 days. And it was a longer, more difficult script. So, and we got hit by two cyclones and we got hit by some accidents and illnesses. And we had a lot of adversity on the second film that we didn't on the first film. The first film, uh, by comparison was a cakewalk. The second film was hard. And, but I think all that sacrifice, the blood, sweat and tears kind of shows up on screen. I think you feel it. I think you feel what the cast and crew were going through to make that movie. I think it's heart beats outside its chest. You know, the, uh, the first one, you had a great budget behind. The second one, you had it substantially reduced. But when you make a movie, it's all about the distribution. Mm -hmm. So given that you had a, a scaled down budget, how did you get the movie out to the people? Uh, you know, you never get the movie out to as many people as you would like no matter how well your movie does, if you're a filmmaker, you think it could have done, wish it would have done better. Um, but it was kind of sheer force of will. Um, when we made the first film, there was no such thing as social media. Um, when you made the second film, we had social media and it was pretty mature and well-developed and a great tool. Um, so that was really, really helpful. Um, the, I, I told you earlier that we had enough money to shoot for 55 days on the first film. We had enough money to shoot for 31 days on the second film. Uh, from a distribution standpoint, we spent about $5 million in today's dollars distributing that film in theaters. We spent uh, about a 10th of that uh, distributing the second film. So it's hard. The math, ma the math is not your friend with independent film. It's just not. Um, there are ways to skin the cat. There are ways to trick the cat into not realizing you just skinned it. <laughs> but uh, the average motion picture in America today, the big tent pole films, they spend a hundred to $200 million uh, just in distribution of marketing costs, let alone how much they cost to produce. Just to get the word out, they spend a hundred to $200 million. It's hard to compete with that. Uh, but, inside the, the niche of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the coast-to-coast -coast niche uh, 
you're able to communicate pretty well with that niche through social media for a price. But the first film, the only way you could tell people what time to see the movie was to take out an ad in their newspaper. You're paying for a little, you know, black and white piece of newsprint. Uh, whereas with the second film, you could do a lot more via social media. So, so. I'm not sure I did a very good job answering that question. I well, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on. I got I got another question for you. Okay, so religion, politics, you know, they're they're kind of the divisive things of this world. I, you know, I, I have a rhetorical question though. We're we're living in a a, a time of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's going through it together, regardless of political affiliation, or religious beliefs, or you know, culture. Um, what I'm finding, though, is the way that you were able to bring out religion in a film and do it in a way that it got viewed across the masses. Hmm. When you look at the pandemic today, and I've heard, I've heard different, uh, different statements like, well, it's kind of a refiner's fire. It's, it's causing us to change the way that we look at things. What, what's your viewpoint on how society is being affected as a whole, not just in this country, but worldwide by a pandemic like this? I feel like the pandemic cuts both ways. Uh, to a great and unfortunate degree, it has been politicized, at least in this country, because it happened to fall during uh, a presidential election. So rather than becoming just a human crisis, a human event became a political event. And the politicization of the pandemic is a great tragedy uh, because I don't think really anybody knows the truth about the pandemic. We only know the truth that has been pitched to us by either the right or left-leaning media that we consume. That's really a tragedy. So, so that aspect of it, I think, is really unfortunate. On the positive side, uh, it's given us all a good dose of humility and a sense of vulnerability uh, that I hope has helped us to value uh, each other in our neighborhood, in our churches, in our schools. Um, I, I feel like there, I feel like there is so much more that we all have in common with each other than than we don't have in common. Uh, we all really feel almost all the same emotions. We have almost all the same doubts and fears and guilt and remorse and hopes and dreams. We all kind of want the same things. And I have a personal theory that by the time we're all 85, we will all just about believe almost all the same things because either the hard way or the easy way, we will have learned the same lessons. We have so much in common. And I, I love the ability of movies to communicate the common humanity between people of different cultures or religions or races. Um, it's, the film medium is by its very nature a propagandistic medium. It's not like a book. If you're writing a book, you can write an 800 page book and say, well, it's possible that he was doing this, but he might've been doing that. It's possible that his motivation was X or Y or Z. We don't, you can go through all the permutations, but when you make a movie, you just gotta decide and tell one version of the story. You can only edit a movie one way and you only have about 110 minutes to tell that story. So you got to decide, okay, which version of the story am I going to tell? And when you make those choices, you can make choices to divide 
or to unite, to create common ground or to create polarity. And I always try to create common ground because I just think we have so much more in common than, than we have that ought to divide us. Frank Capra, Frank Capra, the filmmaker who produced classics, including It's a Wonderful Life, once said, quote, only the morally courageous should be allowed to speak to their fellow men for two hours in the dark, unquote. I love that quote. And I think it, for me, every time I hear it, I want to believe I'm one of the morally, morally courageous ones. I don't know if I am or not, but it makes me really think about the responsibility a filmmaker has to, to tell the truth and to uplift and edify. When you're making those editorial choices, you get to decide, am I going to defile or edify? Am I going to degrade or uplift? You, you get to decide. How am I going to film that? How am I going to ask the actor or actress to perform that? What am I going to have them wear or not wear? Um, am I going to uplift or am I going to... And only the morally courageous should be allowed to speak to their fellow men for two hours in the dark. Think about that. Nobody in the world on earth, no, nobody has as much power over the human populace as the filmmaker. Because the bedrock fundamental principle of filmmaking is quote, willing suspension of disbelief. The audience comes to a movie or a TV show with their defenses down and they want they want to suspend disbelief. They want to escape. They want you to take them on your, on your journey. And it's like, they want to go. So that puts a huge amount of responsibility on the filmmaker to take them to a good place. Uh, and I'm not saying it has to be kumbaya around the campfire. It would be great if it had a moral outcome. If, if the, if the bad guys don't win in the end and the good guys do, if the bad guys suffer for their transgressions, as opposed to getting off Scott, I mean, I cannot imagine any other realm in which a father or mother would allow their children to spend two hours in the dark with the door closed with a stranger than in the world of film. Uh, it used to be in a theater, used to be your kid had to, you had to drop your kid off at the theater and pay for their ticket and maybe buy them popcorn and fruit punch. But now, you know, they're on their laptop or on their phone or on their watch. Uh, you know, now it's coming at them and they're still spending two hours alone in the dark with a complete stranger. But as a parent, you don't have much, con the kind of control over it, the kind of gatekeeper control you used to have. So I think it's even more important now. Mitch, thanks for being with us today. The beautiful messages and uh, best wishes to you in the future endeavors that you do. If you could give one piece of advice for the listeners, about life, given that you've gone through the stage that you're at, what would that be? There's a great moment in The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck's classic novel, where a young man, Junior, is restless. He has gotten his girlfriend pregnant. He doesn't want to deal with the consequences of that. He wants to escape and he goes to his mother, a massive 
matriarch, Ma Jode, for advice. And she says to him something that I think is important. She said, ah, Junior, up ahead, there's a thousand lives you might lead. But when it comes, it'll only be one. Uh, and Joan of Arc said, one life is all you have to live and you live it as you believe in living it. And then it is gone. But to live without belief is more terrible than dying, even more terrible than dying young. I would just say to any youngster out there, live your life with purpose and deliberately for a reason. And I just can't think of any reason better to live your life than for the good of your family and others around you. If you give your life or others, you will find your life. If you live your life for yourself, you will be lost, dazed, confused, and depressed all your days. I promise that. Uh, I speak as one having authority. <laughs> I've done both. Uh, one life is all you have to live and 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 uh and then it's gone <laughs> so yeah make it count well said well said thanks Mitch, for being with us great to be with you 